take us back to right, right to the start. Like, where are you born? Hertzboro, Alabama. Gosh. Abject poverty. Uh, mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, and I lived in a little shack. And that's all that it was. It was a one-bedroom uh, dwelling in Hertzboro with all of those generations there, the sharecroppers, poor. Uh, my father was run out of Alabama uh, by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the norm in, in Hertzboro and other southern cities were fairly straightforward. Black people were subservient uh, to white people. And in Hertzboro, one of the norms was is when it was raining, uh, the black people had to get off of the little wooden plank and walk in the mud so that the white people could, re could remain relatively uh, dry. My father decided that he wasn't going to yield a plank to a white male. But he took his arrogance just a tad too far, uh, his, my wife uh, chuckled later. He knocked the white male into the mud. A few hours later, we packed all of our belongings and we moved from the poverty of the South to poverty of the North, East Chicago, Indiana. For those who don't understand that aspect is that hundreds of thousands of black people moved from the South to the North, but they moved in clusters. We moved into a community that was mostly Alabama and Georgia people. Uh, the Mississippi, Arkansas, and the other people, they had their own areas. This is where Ken, taking care of Ken. But let me back up for a moment and tell you about my mother. When I was born, she said that she looked at me and she told everyone watching, the, uh, the midwife and others, that this baby is going to be the one to take our family out of poverty. Every poor mother says that, believe me. They all wish that for their child, but my mother was a prophet. She was absolutely correct. This baby did indeed take his family out of poverty, first to graduate from high school, college, first everything. But the significance of that to me is even broader. My nickname in East Chicago was Red, in, in, in Alabama was Red. I had no idea, why people call me Red? Well, my father's mother, on whose land we lived, was a Native American. And my mother said that she held me and she looked at me and she said, this is my little Red. And that's how I got that name. And I, I didn't know why in the world people were calling me Red. Yeah. It was her. But my family never talked about that side of it. Uh, they just simply didn't. East Chicago, Indiana. Uh, a new beginning? Not really. The poverty of the South was not much different than the poverty of the North, except it was in the North it was a bit more sophisticated. I lived in places... For 12 years, I never had a room. For 12 years, my bed was a pull-out bed under the couch in the living room. We lived in places that were too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter. Dilapidated structures that absentee owners refused to repair. I grew up with roaches, bed bugs, and rats. We were poor, I know poverty. I know what dirt poor means because we were dirt poor. On and off welfare, we rarely had a full meal of anything. I learned to make uh, sandwiches out of just bread uh, and, and, and pretend that I had things on it. Uh, but back to my mother again. Whenever we did have a good meal, and a good meal meant uh, uh, we had chicken. And we had one scrawny chicken usually. And my father and I ate, and my mother would say, as we were looking at the last few a couple of pieces, and says, George, you and kid, that was my father's name, you can have that. My mother always said she was going to eat later. Darn it, I was in college, and it dawned on me, mother never ate later. Later never came for her. She sacrificed so that the men could be fed. That was my mother. My mother told me that I love you almost every day of my life, and she would hug me and tickle me, and I was always a kind of a serious kid, and she would tell me raunchy jokes to make me laugh. That was my mom. But then, that was my mother's sister because my mother had me when she was 
16 and a half years of age. My father was 21. I was, I was her child, but I was also her brother. My mother taught me to accept people and to share what little we had. My very first birthday when I was 11, 12 years, when I really wanted something very important, a tricycle, my father bought boxing gloves. I'll never forget that Christmas. After we had chicken, we went downstairs into where the, uh, we had a shed for storage. We went under the shed and my father put the gloves on and he, put, and he put his on and he beat me. And that was a ritual. That was a ritual for about three weeks. Eat, go downstairs, box with dad, get beat up by dad. And finally, when I was able to fight back, my father looked at me and said, son, now you're ready for the world. He said, you're a black boy and you're gonna be a black man in this world. And you've got to fight, you've got to fight for yourself and for your family. My mother didn't like that exercise because my mother was a very religious person. My mother taught me to love, my father taught me to fight. But my father also taught me what the limits of the fighting was. Don't fight white people. They have a license to kill you. But when black, black boys indeed challenge you, you accept the challenge. You, so I was, I grew up fighting. I knew how to fight. Mm -hmm. I also, the other side of me, I, I, I love my mother's love more than I love my father's fighting. And I'll never forget, I was about 14 and a half, maybe 15. It was a Saturday. And mom came to me and she says, George, tomorrow we're going to church. I said, but dad doesn't go. And she says, I'm not your father's mother, but I'm yours. You're going to church. This is not a conversation. Get ready. That was my first experience in church. And it was the first of a lot of experiences. My mother was my first social secretary. All the girls were there. Darn it. For the first five Sundays, I chased girls. I didn't catch any. But I chased and I ran. And finally, when I was tired, after about two weeks of that nonsense, I sat down and I listened to the minister. Never forget that sermon. At the end of it, it says, God is love. Period. That's a complete sentence. Not hatred, not bigotry, not all of the other things that we're dealing with in this world. Love. And I said to myself, I've always had these weird thoughts, I, I consider them weird thoughts, about what my life was going to be and why it was and so forth. And I said to myself, if God can love a poor kid like me, then surely, surely there's a place for me in this world. Thanks for listening. Uh, thank you. Huge shout out to, to Shannon for co-hosting with me. So I can't even speak. Um, for co-hosting uh, this one with me. Um, we dive into a lot more questions, uh, you know, at, in the second half of the podcast. Um, but yeah, this episode is presented by the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, uh, sharing Oklahoma stories through its people since 1929. They, they do a fantastic job and I, it's an honor to be partnered with them. So please go follow them on Instagram at Oklahoma Hall of Fame. And then for anything, their events, go to their website, um, www.oklahomahalloffame.com. Uh, and don't forget to follow us at This Is Oklahoma. Thanks for listening, and part two is coming next week. Cheers. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram. This podcast was produced by Mike Hearn and Ian Weston, mixed by Alan Brown, with music by Chad Duro.